One of the reasons that Stanley Kubrick's films seem to have such a lasting impact, I think, is that they're not simply about the moment when they're created. One of the main conflicts in Dr. Strangelove does have to do with the concerns of the day. This is not too long after the Cuban Missile Crisis. There is a lot of paranoia about the possibility of nuclear conflict. Kubrick himself was really worried that there are all these nuclear bombs out there, and one little slip-up could mean the end of life as we know it. So, in a sense, the movie is about that very contemporary concern, but it goes beyond that, and it, it has this symbolic dimension. Uh, it's really about the future of humanity. It's our failure to recognize the humanity and other people that leads to all sorts of problems. And part of what explains that is the mythological qualities of the film. Kubrick's films seem to be drawing upon mythological figures, mythological structures, even though that may not be immediately apparent. I think thinking about them in terms of mythology might help us to understand why a film like Dr. Strangelove speaks to something more fundamentally human. We know that Kubrick was a voracious reader and essentially a, a self-taught intellectual. And of the many, many, many books that he read, he read a lot of Jung, he read a lot of Freud, and he read Joseph Campbell. We know that he gave Arthur C. Clarke a copy of The Hero with the Thousand Faces when they were working together in the mid-60s. So I think it's fair to assume that immediately prior to that, when Kubrick was working on Dr. Strangelove, he was already aware of Campbell. And Campbell, for me, provides a kind of entry point into understanding how Jungian archetypes work in mythology. Often when we think about myths and mythology, we think about supernatural creatures like Gorgons and uh, Hydras, things like that. But by myth, I mean simply stories that speak to the fundamental human conflicts, the search for understanding our place in the universe. So myths attempt to help us grapple with these irresolvable questions about the human condition and come to terms with them in symbolic ways. There are some critics who reject this, this kind of approach to, to looking at films in general, uh, who would suggest that, you know, Campbell's hero's journey or the, this idea of the hero with a thousand faces is too simplistic and that if, if, if stories are simply following this formula and hitting certain points, then uh, somehow that they're, they're not complex. I don't think that's what's happening. I don't think many filmmakers say, okay, here's my story, now let me make it conform to these things. And Kubrick certainly was not doing that. And Campbell points out that, you know, humans from all different historical eras and all different parts of the world share the same basic anatomy and physiology. Why not the same basic mental structures as well? It doesn't seem like such a leap to think that there are these psychological forms or the capacity for understanding these forms and relating to questions of morality and philosophy through those common forms. Jung and Freud saw a lot of value in dream analysis, and they found that their troubled patients were having dreams that were very similar in quality. Jung especially noted th that these same kinds of figures would appear in the dreams of one patient after another after another, and he identified these as what he called archetypes. Now, there are dozens and dozens of archetypes, but there are some that are more common than others, and one of the most common archetypes is the shadow. And the shadow is in some ways analogous to Freud's concept of the id. It's that part of the personality that we don't really want to acknowledge. So the killer instinct, for example, is something that is down there in our psyche somewhere. 
a lot of Kubrick's films, some of them even explicitly talk about the duality of man, the dual nature of man. Man is both an animal and uh, a higher level being. How is it that we can create great symphonies and yet we're always trying to kill each other at the same time? Early 60s, mid 60s, this would have been very much alive in the cultural memory. And that suggests somehow a rebirth, that even if humanity were to get to the point of destruction and annihilation, something would come after that. That human quality, I think, is something that, that is there through a lot of Kubrick's work. He gets a bad rap as being uh, misanthropic and cold. I don't think that's true at all. I think he just has a different, maybe more honest take on humanity. It's almost like he's saying, okay, we're pretty despicable <laughs> as a race of beings, but we still have the capacity for humanity. There is still the capacity for compassion and art. And, you know, we, we were able to get off the planet. We have science. We have all these things. And so Kubrick is an artist who wants to give us experiences of humanity. And he creates that as kind of contemporary enactments of mythological stories and mythological type figures who are trying to live as human beings in a contemporary world, but those struggles speak to something larger and more universal then I think Kubrick's films will continue to be talked about as long as people are talking about film.